All right, so for tonight's presentation, let me fix this. There I am. All right, so for tonight's presentation, we had to scramble a little bit. We're going to do a dual presentation. And Steve, who is on Zoom, is going to do the first half and cover soda. And then I will take over and do the second half and cover poda. So I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Bob was uh, under the weather, and um, I, basically we took his slides and made a few modifications to them, but they're, they're technically his slides since uh, we really didn't have much time to um, prepare for it. So I'm going to talk about summits on the air. And um, basically do an introduction for um, soda, and then um, Trisha is going to pick up and, and do uh, uh, parking on the air. So, who am I? Um, my name's Steve, WG0AT, live in Monument, and I was first licensed in 1958, believe that. Self-studied the ARRL, um, how to become a radio amateur, and uh, self-taught my, myself Morris code. Actually, I had a buddy that, that we practiced back and forth um, and got our code speed up to five words a minute, which is you can pretty much memorize the uh, Morris code table and uh, write down at that speed, um, you know, the dits and dots. I don't recommend that, but anyway, um, I'm pretty much non-technical, although I've learned a lot over the last 65 years of being licensed. Um, my background, I studied art, California Institute of the Arts, and I did a short stint in the US Army. And when I got out, it, this was during the Vietnam era, when I got out, I, I figured out that, hey, I'd better um, do something that can I can earn a living at. And so I switched from fine art to um, commercial art, and I got a degree in graphic design at Long Beach State College under the GI Bill. And what wound up working in marketing at Hewlett Packard, of all places, uh, for decades in the electronic uh, test and measurement industry. And it was a great place to work because uh, when I put together um, one of my little QRP uh, kit radios and it didn't work, I could wander into the lab and say, hey, Fred, I'll buy you lunch. <laughs> and, and he would clear off his bench and uh, take a look, fire up all his expensive instruments and take a look at this little radio that I had soldered together and uh, debug it. So my main interest in ham radio is kind of the confluence of building HF gear, uh, mainly QRP CW, and then hiking to summits with it and making contacts worldwide. So that's kind of what turns, rose my boat, so to speak. Um, and since I redid, the, redid this slide, Bob had um, a little plug for his book. One of uh, Bob's in interests is writing and um, he recently wrote this great book on VHF summits and more, having fun with ham radio, and it's available on uh, on Amazon. So summits on the air. It's a program uh, that originally started in the UK and came over to the the colonies, so to speak, about um, 10, 11 years ago. And there's two ways to participate. One is uh, activator, that is the person that goes up and um, either drives to or climbs uh, a mountaintop and um, puts it on the air. And then there's the chasers who uh, make contact with us and they find out about where we are by a website where you can post an alert or, um, or you can just ad hoc get on the air and hope that somebody's going to hear you, and um, they can go and uh, put a spot in for you, so to speak. It's a worldwide program managed by locally by associations, usually covering one state. There's points and award uh, system, 
Um, the higher elevation summits get more points, obviously. Uh, they tend to be a little more difficult to get to. SOTA activation requirements are the summit must be on the SOTA list. You can't just uh, go hike a hill somewhere and pull out your HT and start activating it if it's not on the list. Equipment must be carried, but there's no minimum distance. In other words, you could drive to Pikes Peak and get out of your car and pull your HT out of your pocket. And so long as you, you're, you're not near the ve or not attached to the vehicle, um, you're, you're within the spirit of, of, of the SOTA program. And, the, and your power source must be portable. I got to take a drink of water. I'm sorry. <clears throat> and as far as fossil fuel generators go, uh, your your power supply or your I should say your battery can be obviously recharged by um, a fossil fuel generator, but it can't be at your site, something to do beforehand. There's tons of information at www.soda.org.uk. There's soda sites, um, mountains all over the US. Um, I think Kansas is, is the only state and Florida that don't have any soda summits to speak of. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed a question. So, <clears throat> excuse me, HF or VHF, take your pick or you can do both. Matter of fact, I don't, I don't head off to do a soda without an HD in my pocket. Um, it's, it's, you know, it, it's just another source of communication. Um, and obviously with VHF, UHF, you've got height above terrain. So it's, it's kind of a, a given that, that VHF would be um, very usable and um, compact and convenient and uh, something you could put in your pocket or hang on your belt. But you're dependent on your location and access to population centers, in other words, uh, local chasers. It's mostly FM. Some sideband is used on, for VHF contests. Um, and technician license can play. On HF, um, it's classic QRP operation, then uh, not necessarily QRP. I know some guys that will haul up a, you know, hundred watt HF radio, um, just for the fun of it. But typically, uh, CW and sideband. Longer distance contacts are available, and thus more radio contacts. Um, it's recommended for general class or higher. Uh, I've known a couple of technicians that have gotten on who've been uh, learning CW and gotten on the uh, CW portion of the bands of HF and, and made contacts via, via SOTA. This is an interesting slide. 80% um, of the SOTA QSOs logged below uh, 50 megahertz. Um, 20% of the SOTA contacts are logged, that are logged, are above 50 megahertz. And above 50 megahertz, two, two meter FM is the most dominant of that. Had to move the gallery over to the side because it was covering up my slides. I couldn't read it. Um, and 90% of the QSOs are on the two meter band and 85% above 50 megahertz are FM. So 
pretty good chance if you've got a two meter FM HT, uh, you can bet that you'll probably be able to make a, a couple of soda contacts, um, provided you're on a, a designated soda peak. And how do you find out what those peaks are? Um, again, a website lists out by region um, all the the soda uh, listed uh, peaks. Here's Bob um, taking along a two meter handheld on a hike, and he happens to be on a designated uh, soda peak, uh, Kaufman Ridge, which is just outside of Buena Vista. So you're on a on a soda peak, and um, you've got your HT with you. You want to be heard. Best way to be heard is have an antenna, a good antenna, a rubber duck that comes with your HT from the manufacturer. Uh, may get you into a repeater, and it may get you across town, uh, working simplex, but. Um, up on a mountaintop away from a population center, you need a good antenna. And um, the bigger the better in this category. Um, this particular antenna is a real bargain. Um, Bob turned me on to it, and um, I've got one that I carry in my pack all the time. Um, not fully extended. Um, but I usually, on trail, for communications, if I'm going with somebody, I'll, I'll use a rubber duck. But once I get to the uh, top of the mountain or the RF site where I'm going to operate, um, out comes this antenna and fully extended. And it, it really does extend your range. Also, there's roll-up J-pole antennas for two meters, um, typically 54 inches long. And you can hang it in a tree or on a push-up mast or your hiking stick, hang it on something higher up. Basically a half wave radiator with a quarter wave matching section. And these things are, you can make these things yourself, uh, provided you can find some, some twin lead. Um, and there's, there's dual band uh, versions available. I think there's several folks that are selling them on eBay and, and uh, ST and Banggood, um, as well as Amazon. Another way to improve your signal on on VHF is to use a two meter Yagi, like an arrow three element Yagi. And here's Bob's better half choice, participating in um, a program called. Colorado 14 er event, which happens once a year. She's on, I think it's um, Humboldt Peak. And again, Bob's better half on uh, Eagle Rock, which is out in the middle of um, South Park. <laughs> it's so funny, that's a little red uh, water bowl somebody must have brought up for their dog and left it there. It's been there for a couple of years now. I'm surprised it hasn't blown away. One of the things to think about if operating VHF is you want to be heard. And um, when you're off on some of these uh, far away peaks, filing uh, or posting an alert beforehand is really helpful. Uh, as far as you know, raising the awareness that hey, I'm going to be out there somewhere between 10 o'clock and, and noon, and because um, trying to drum up four contacts in the middle of the week when there's not a lot of people on the air, or in the winter time, um, can be difficult. Here, Bob and Joyce are out uh, in the middle of. Uh, South Park on Spinning Mountain next to Spinning Reservoir. And uh, 
he's he's uh, sacking the deck by the, the fact he's brought his three element beam and I think he's got a a, a little miniature uh, mobile radio that puts out 30 watts and uh, knowing Bobby's probably also alerted some of his friends um, who are VHF enthusiasts and to get his his four contacts. Here again, um, this is uh, David uh, KI6YMZ on Mount, Mount Elbert. This is back in 2015. And again, this is a uh, Colorado 14er event where a lot of folks go up on the weekend of the 14er event and try and work each other as well as uh, uh, pick stations. Basically, everybody can participate, and the whole idea is just getting out and having fun. So here's Bob on, on Three Mile Mountain, uh, in, again at South Park. And this time he's got um, his FT-991, which I'm sure that radio is in the five-pound category. And he's I'm just looking at the picture here. I'm sure he's got a, a beefy battery to run that thing. But... So he's probably running maybe 50 to 100 watts for this rail. And uh, he hears um, Larry N0LL calling him from a distance of um, 300, almost 400 miles, 372 miles. And so this is his, his best two meter uh, DX to date. And this was on sideband during the uh, VHF contest, I believe. So it's pretty amazing the distance that you can cover sometimes uh, when you get up on top of some of these peaks, um, provided you know, you've prepared uh, ahead of time about how to make your signal go further with antennas, et cetera. And maybe some power, and maybe some strategically uh, placed alerts and emails to friends. So this is uh, a peak up in Washington. I was up visiting my my brother-in-law, and uh, we went up and did Silver Peak, and we we had uh, push-up mask and an amphib, uh wire antenna and uh, I can't remember what radio I had at that time. It was probably an FT-817, which is kind of a Swiss Army knife of uh, QRP radios. It does 160 meters through 70 meters. I gotta take another drink of water, folks. It's not as heavy as uh, Bob's FT-991 at two and a half pounds. On receive, um, it it drinks a half amp, which is uh, a lot of battery. And it does, does lack an ATU, but there's always uh, dipoles and uh, resonant antennas that you can, um, or bring an ATU with, like Caleb has got here in his pack. And like I said, it's it's uh, doing all modes. You can use it on um, VHF, UHF. Um, it's it, it's kind of the workhorse. It's, it's getting pretty long on the tooth, though. It's been around for about 12 years. And entered the uh, Elecraft KX3. The, the advantage of it is that it's only it's, it's a pound lighter at one and a half pounds. It it, it does have an ATU option and paddle option. Um, it's it's not doesn't necessarily come with that. You have to pay for it. Um, it does cover uh, 160 through six meters. Uh, there's a two meter module available for it. Um, and it's it's basically a shack on a box uh, as far as just hook up a wire to it and 
hit the tune button and you're on the air. And then it's a little brother came along, the KX2, and it's it's a great radio in terms of now you're talking lightweight, 13 ounces, you know, less than a pound. A uh, bit of 8 through 10 meters, but it does do all modes. Um, and the receiver, uh, just on receive, only drinks about 200 mils. You, you can adjust that downward from that number. It does have an ATU and paddle option. Uh, so once again, you're, you've got a shack in the box, hook up a, a wire antenna to it, push, hit the tune button, and bingo, you're on the air. Another entry recently in this marketplace is the ICOM 705, which really has great frequency coverage, uh, 160 through 70 centimeters, all modes. And then it's got all these bells and whistles as far as uh, it's got a GPS in it. It does Wi-Fi. Um, it can be used as a hotspot. Uh, I think there's folks that have written some uh, some apps where you can actually control the uh, 705 from your cell phone and over the inter internet, which means you could re remote this radio. Um, I've had it on a, a summit on Mount Hermon a couple of times, and it's really a fun radio with all of that capability to be sitting up on, on a mountaintop. Um, but whether or not it would you have, have used that capability is another story. It does have a snap-on battery that fits on the back of it. It's basically the, one of the HT batteries for one of the ICOM HTs. Uh, in that mode, it, it drops down to five watts, whereas uh, on, on 12 volts, it, it's a full 10 watts. It has a beautiful watercolor display and um, spectrum uh, of the band, which the advantage is jumping to different bands. Immediately, you can see what how much activity there is, what's going on, or whether you just switch to a dead band. It does lack an ATU, but there's lots of ATUs on the market nowadays that, um, um, as well as manual antenna tuner, tuners that play with it well. And it's. Uh, Weight-wise, it's kind of about where the KX3 is, about two pounds, maybe two and a half pounds. So antennas, here's Steve, K K7PX, my uh, hiking buddy, putting up uh, a mast for his NFIT half wave um, on Snicktow Mount, Mount, Snicktow Mountain, I think it's called. Anyway, it's, that's the Eisenhower Tunnel and I-70 there in the background. And um, w when you're above tree line, there's you've got to either bring a mast or uh, figure out a way to to you know set up your antenna. And these fiberglass telescopic masks are really handy for that purpose. So he's where he set up the his mast is actually downhill from where he's. Um, decided to sit and operate. So his an antenna is actually downhill from him, comes up to his uh, trekking pole, and then over to his, his radio setup. It was really hot that day, and uh, we had to break out the umbrella to keep the radio cool enough to operate. So dipoles are, are great antennas. Um, it, it, they are resonant, so you don't need an ATU, and they're fairly easy to deploy. Um, but then you have this this piece of coax, uh, and if you're using uh, you know good coax, usually it's it's uh, the larger diameter, heavier uh, time, like uh, RG eight X. Um, 50 feet of that in your pack is uh, probably a couple pounds by itself. And um, 
again, you know, if you're dry, doing a drive up, it's no big deal. But if you're going to be walking three, four miles to get back to a a peak that's uh, back back in the back country, uh, every little ounce adds up over time. Thus, enter the end-fed wire, and that's kind of the my go-to antenna for um, soda activations. But there was, there's a unique problem about feeding the end of a half-wave antenna, and that is the impedance is sky high, and um, but there's a solution is uh, a ballon impedance transformer that transforms that high impedance down to something that's reasonable. And there's a lot of um, diagrams on the internet that um, lay out the, the basic transformer and there's all kinds of, of ways of winding, it, winding them now. And uh, they're pretty, pretty standard um, and easy to do. I built one in this little dental floss case and then I attached the wire and I've got about six feet of uh, RG174, a little miniature coax that go attaches to my rig and uh, bingo, I'm on the air. So it's really um, a 49 to one <clears throat> um, ballon that transforms the two to 3,000 ohms down to 50 ohms to something that keeps your your transmitter happy and blowing up. Here I built one in a um, contact lens, lens case. And there's, there's kits available. QRP guys have uh, a kit that you can purchase and put together. And I just put together this this uh, K6 A ARK uh, antenna kit that's available on Amazon. And the whole transformer is on the back end, rides on the back end of the BNC connector. And this, I, I just, I built this thing the uh, day before yesterday and measured it yesterday with the antenna analyzer. And I, with this 67 foot piece of wire, I can get four bands. I get 40, 20, 15 which was a surprise at 10 meters. And uh, the SWR is, is down there below 1.5 to one. So I'm pretty pleased with it. Another version of this antenna is to put traps in the wire and make it, you know, as many, many bands as you want, uh, depending upon how many traps you, you put in it. This is another antenna that's kind of my go-to HF antenna. And it weighs about three ounces. There's all kinds of batteries out there. Um, this this Bayeno uh, LiPo, LiPo uh, 4 battery, lithium ion phosphate battery, is pretty popular. Um, and um, has a capacity for running more power for longer longer periods of time. It weighs a pound, which is not bad. And so there's there's uh, the, the other side of the story is chasing, and why would you chase? Um, because it's fun. It improves your listening skills. Uh, and I mean, if you like to work DX at all, uh, digging signals out of the noise. I mean, you know, you've got these, these activators are dragging uh, low power equipment up to a mountaintop. And if they're smart, they post it an alert. So uh, you, can, you can see when they're about to be on the air and, you know, plus or minus, uh, I mean, hiking and, uh, whether it, it's always uh, kind of a crapshoot as far as saying that, wait, I'm going to be on a peak at uh, 11 a.m. today. And you may arrive early, you may arrive late. And uh, 
But as soon as, uh, it, it, and one of the other tools as an activator is uh, the ability to self-spot on the website so that um, the chasers know that you're 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 there now and you've got your antenna up and and you're calling CQ. So um, one of the reasons I like to chase is just because it's part of the community um, and also because I'm kind of paying back for all the time. All these folks have chased me and now they're out activating. It's, um, and it's it's really kind of a dance. I mean, it, it takes chasers to make this program work and it takes activators to make, make it work. And um, it's it takes two to, to dance, so to speak. And there's there's awards for for both act, activators and uh, chasers. And as far as the tools go, like I said, there's um, so it's soda watch dot org dot uk is the website that has the spotting page and um, the the alert page. So that's pretty much. Um, I have the presentation if um, Trisha, if you're aboard. Yep, I am uh, good to go. Okay, unless, unless there was any questions in terms of some what's on the air, I'll turn it over to uh, Trish. This is also Bob's slides. So bear with me, I'm not as familiar with this presentation as he would be but we are gonna go with what we've got. So my name is not Bob. I am again, Trisha, K0TRD. I live in the Springs and I was first licensed in March of 2020. So I'm still pretty recent. I upgraded to general in September of 2020. And then I went to extra in November. I have no technical background. So that's why that part is just completely blank on my slide. This is, been a really, really big challenge for me to try and get all this technical stuff down, but it's also been really, really fun. And I've met some really awesome people along the way. So ham radio interests. I really like portable antennas. I love POTA chasing when I can't be out there activating. I also really like activating. It's the highlight of my day when I can generate a pileup. It just, it makes my whole day. And I also really, I'm pretty interested in propagation. I don't really understand it very well, but I would like to understand it better. And it is, it just kind of fascinates me. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. And there is the website for parks on the air. And this is also a worldwide. It's mainly the US is where most of the parks are, but there are parks, they're adding more countries all the time. And I've actually contacted a couple of um, stations that were in England. That seems to be a pretty popular area. And I've seen some Japans coming up too. So that's pretty neat that Parks on the Air is now going nationwide as well. So Parks on the Air is a radio sport program. It encourages communications, portable operations, and it is from state, provincial, and nationally managed pub public lands. So just like soda, the park has to be on their list. And what tends to be on their list is state parks, um, national parks, national monuments, and national forests. Regional parks don't get added because they just don't have the database for it. This is primarily all run by volunteers and they just only have so much time just like the rest of us. So there are a really large set of references and parks out there and a little bit of a shorter set of rules than what soda has. And that's kind of part of what attracted it, me to it is it's just not quite as complicated for the activators. So same thing, there are activators and there are chasers, a little bit different terminology, but the same kind of idea. There are fewer restrictions. So if you have commercial power available to you where you're activating, use it. There is no restriction against that. If you want to haul a generator, do it. If you have a vehicle that can provide power, you can use that. If you have a radio installed in your vehicle, you can use that. 
There's no restrictions over those types of things. And so it makes it a lot more accessible and it makes it a lot more universal. Pretty much everybody anywhere lives somewhere close by to a park. So on the federal level, like I said, national parks, national monuments, national forests, national rec areas, wildlife refuges, wilderness areas, scenic trails. There are a little bit more specific rules if you're on a trail that you do have to be within a certain amount of distance. I think it's 100 feet next to a trail. Otherwise, you just have to be within the park boundary. And your entire setup has to be within the park boundary. So for most parks, that includes the parking lot, which means vehicle activations during the winter are a really good way to go. Um, on the state level, you've got state parks, state forests, state rec areas, wildlife refuges, but no county, no city parks. And in the US, the designators are all K dash, and then there will be a number. And that's how all the parks are referenced. Different countries will have a different letter in front of the park number. And so that's a really nice way to know if you see on the spot page, it's not a K, you know it's not US. There's kind of a, a list of off of the website of a park list. It looks like he's got it sorted for Colorado. And there's a lot of resources on the webpage to where you can go out there and do all kinds of research on where you wanna activate. You can look for like over on the columns, you can see how many times that park has been attempted to be activated versus how many successful activations. So if you wanna go out there and activate a park, everybody's been having trouble getting, you can be the one that got it. You can find one that nobody's been to and nobody's activated at all, not even attempted. Or you can go for one that get activa activates all the time and everybody's kind of got their own thing that they like to focus on. This is a map showing all of the parks. I don't know, like I said, these are not my slides, so I don't know how long ago this was. There's probably more of them now. And this doesn't even show all of the other countries that have parks as well. But it's a, it's a pretty worldwide thing now. Just in Colorado, every yellow dot is a park. Granted, some of those are not exactly, like the yellow dot isn't always exactly where the park is. Because say a national forest, you got to pick somewhere to put the dot. It's a big area. So you really have to do some research in some of these areas and make sure you're going to the right place and you know where the boundaries are. So types of activators, you can do backpack portable, you can do a picnic table, you can operate from your vehicle, you can do a campsite, um, you can do field day style where you set up multiple different antennas. You can kind of combine any of those things that you want to put together. So it's really, really versatile. That's a picture of the battery that I use. A um, little bit bigger than what the soda folks use because I'm not hauling it up a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> so I also am personally not running QRP. I'm running a 991A is what I've been activating with. Not a, a radio that I would want to hike up a mountain with, but I'm totally fine with taking it out of the truck and putting it on the tailgate or hiking it to a, a picnic table just away from the parking lot. So I don't mind having the bigger battery either. Trisha, how long could you operate your 991 with that battery? I have not killed it yet, so I don't know yet. <laughs> how long have you operated? Um, the, the longest, I probably the biggest challenge I gave it was the last activation I did. I was driving home from Crested Butte, and I did two park activations on my way, drive home. And I had no way to charge it in between those two. So it ran two activations. And when I pulled, brought, brought it home to plug it in, it was about halfway down. So several hours. that's my gosh, yeah. And it really depends too on how much you're talking. Trish, so did we use that for about four hours. On we did day. use it on Winterfield Day as well. And granted, we weren't operating the radio a lot, but it sat there in idle for it probably four hours. It wasn't CW, it was fun. No. No, and the radio was cranked up to 100 watts. I think we were from noonish to five-ish. Yeah. Know? And it was pretty constant use. Yeah. Yeah, I've been very impressed with that battery. 
Yeah, yeah it was not a cheap battery. <laughs> <laughs> I will agree with that. <laughs> so are people familiar with that type of battery, the light LFP batteries? And that is the only battery to be buying these days. Yeah. Yeah. And, yep, and that battery has a 10 year warranty too. 10 year warranty on that battery, Trish. Yep, yeah. I agree. You just got to make sure that the uh, battery charger is good for the right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So this is my N Fed antenna. I don't need to have a little tiny ballon because, same thing, I'm not hauling it up a, uh, up a mountain. I'm usually hiking it more than. A couple hundred feet would be about the high, the furthest that I hike. Call that. So that is actually from the kit on the AWRL website. That's the kit that they're selling, and I put that together. And if I can put that together, anybody can put that together. I have proof. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a picture of my truck at the last park. It's one of the parks I activated on that drive home from Crested Butte. That's actually just outside of Pen Penrose. There's a wildlife area there. And it's just recently in Colorado, they've added the wildlife areas as part of the parks. So most of them have not been activated very many times. So that's part of what attracted to me. You can also see that the horizon is not real challenging there for antenna. So that also kind of attracted me because the upside of soda you're up on top of a mountain, you've got great propagation, you don't have obstacles versus parks on the air. Those parks weren't all designed for radio operating. They're all nice. Well, most of them are pretty nice and quiet locations radio wise, but not all of them are ideally set up for propagation. So you also learn to have multiple antennas in your arsenal because you don't always know you know, when you're going to a park that's a couple hours away from your house, you don't always know until you get there what your situation is going to be. You may have no trees, as this one shows. There's no way that I could have set up an end unless I brought a mast. So this is a Wolf River coil that's actually on top of the truck in place of my regular UHF VHF antenna. So we just put an adapter on there, screwed that on there, and I've already got the coax running in the truck. So I just unplugged it from the radio in the truck and into my HF ring, and I'm good to go. And it's multi-band antenna, so I've just got that coil up there that I can change where that taps and change my band. And it's not hard to reach from the side of the truck if I just climb up there. This is picture of Backpack Portable with Joyce on Three Mile Mountain. And that's a really good egg. Uh, example of how Coda and Soda can actually work together because a lot of these mountains are in national forests. So if you activate a mountain that is within a national forest boundary, you can actually do pro two programs with the same activation, which also increases your chances of getting enough contacts because now you've got more chasers. And this is a picnic table setup. Um, I don't know for sure exactly where it is. This is Bob's picture, but kind of a neat example of you can even bring along a computer. I don't usually because I usually, I'm just not a techno person. I want less tech. <laughs> this is, I thought, a really awesome example of why we do this. Not only is it really fun to generate that pileup and have all those people chasing you, this is the scenery you get to look at while you're operating radio. And it's just really, really awesome. You've got nature. You've often got people walking up asking what you're doing. So you get to be an ambassador for radio for explaining that ham radio is not just about sitting in a basement with a shack. It also is about communications. And so it's a really, really good way to be an ambassador. Another example of a really awesome scenic area. I, I would love to know where that is in Cooper. It's in Pennsylvania somewhere. So that just looks like an awesome place to spend the day operating on the radio and looking at that scenery. Um, another one of my truck, this was that same trip to Crested Butte. This is in the Gunnison National Forest. And it's just west of Crested Butte is where I got into the National Forest. 
I'm actually just barely inside the boundary because that's where they stop plowing the road. And there's multiple parking spots there because they rent snowmobiles. And so there was a lot of ample parking. I liked because I was parked in front of a no parking zone. But there are hours on that I will like, like everybody to know. I was <laughs> not within those hours. <laughs> that is something that POTA is very, very adamant about is being a good ambassador also means following the rules. So if the park is closed, you shouldn't be activating it because you can't be there. You should also be respectful of the park rules. Some parks are national historic sites. So you need to make sure that you understand whether or not you need a permit to be there. What antennas are allowed? What can you do? What can't you do? You don't want to be in the middle of a pileup and have a ranger come up and say, you can't be here. You can't have that antenna up here and you can't be doing this. That's not a cool thing right in the middle of trying to do this. So make sure that you do your research before you go to a park to find out for sure what the rules are. National forests, they're pretty lenient. I've never had a problem. I've never even had a ranger come over. And this, I did the activation. It was nine degrees out. I did this activation from the back seat of my truck. <laughs> <laughs> and I did not change bands. I found one, I tuned it, and that's where I sat. <laughs> Um, this is a little bit warmer location, not our part of the country, but looks like a really cool place to camp out. And then this is a map that I did of one of my activations, and it shows with a portable rig on a battery that you can still really, really get a signal out there. And this was actually during a camping trip. So, excuse me. We are up in kind of the Terriol area. It's north of Lake George. And we now pick our camping spots based on, is it on top of a hill? And how many trees do we have? <laughs> <laughs> so we usually have multiple antennas set up. And if it's really, really nice out, we'll set up a table or put the radio on the tailgate and sit outside. If it's not nice out, we put the radio inside the camper and we can still run. And are those spots or activations? Those are contacts. contacts. Yep. Yeah. And notice who's right in the middle. Nice, <laughs> nice uh, contact right there in the middle. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I picked this one on purpose because <laughs> it kind of highlighted you there. <laughs> All right. There's also group events. Some people will activate it as partners and like hand the mic back and forth between two activators. Some people will do group activations with multiple stations set up, and they'll operate in different modes from the same location. And each one of those is a separate activation. And from the hunter standpoint, each one of those is also a contact. So the hunter could actually contact each one of those operators if they're all either on different bands or different modes, and they get credit for all of those. So that's kind of a neat way to go, too, to try and attract more, more hunters. That I thought was a really nice close-up picture of the Wolf River coil. It's a very, very popular portable antenna. And it has a telescoping mast. And that's just, it's set up as a tripod. So then it needs radials. When I put it on the top of my truck, I use the truck as the ground plane. Which at nine degrees, I didn't want to set up radials. <laughs> so how to activate a photo park. You do need to have 10 QSOs, so the, the requirement is a little bit higher than it is for soda, but you're also not limited to QRP because you're not hauling your gear. So it's not as challenging to get the 10. You do have to do it within the UTC day. So you've got 24 hours to make those 10 QSOs or QSOs, and you do have to be fully inside the boundaries of the park. And on any band that your privileges allow, any contact counts unless it's a repeater. You can even do a satellite contact. You can, if there's a contest going on, you can do hunt and pounce. Those contacts count even if they didn't know that you were a quota activation. So if you're having a rough time, you can't find a spot to operate, propagation is rough, find something, somebody else that's operating and go for them. That can be part of your 10. 
And I've actually done an activation where that's exactly what I did. It was an international DX contest. And my entire activation, I think I got 12 or 15. I wanted a little leeway in case I had a problem with one of them. And they were all international contacts. And none of them hunted me. I never called CQ. So you can really have a lot of fun with it. Um, the recommendation is to operate in the general bands because you've got a lot more people in that. But there's no requirement. There's no specific calling frequencies. And there's no specific exchange that's required. So most people will just exchange the call sign and your signal report. The signal reports are real because the activator really does want to know how, not only where my signal is going, but how good is it getting there? Because part of this is learning about portable operation and understanding, okay, well, I did it on this antenna and I got to Tennessee, but I got a 3-3 report. Let's see if we could do better. Let's see if I can get to Tennessee with a 5-5. Five five. So it's a really nice way to kind of experiment and understand how all of, all of that works and what you can do to make it better. Um, for the log, you need your date, your time, and the band. And that's the requirement. So the signal report is actually not required for the log. Most of us put it in there anyway, but it's not required. And you email an ADF file to your POTA area, call area coordinator. The call area coordinators are based on the number in your call sign. It's not the area you activated. It's the number in your call sign. And so each area coordinator, you just email it to them and they're volunteers. Sometimes you get it uploaded into the site a day or two later. Sometimes it's three weeks later but they're all volunteers and we try to be really patient and try and follow the rules so that we reduce the workload on them. They do have plans in the future to let activators upload directly. And I think that's gonna be a huge improvement for everybody, including those area coordinators. So calling CQ, there really isn't any specific like rules. So just the basic CQ parks on the air, identify your park, identify your call sign. There is a website where you can go to put spots up. So just like Steve was talking about with Soda, it is, it is super helpful to put a spot up. You can put it on the calendar if you know where you're gonna be and you know an approximate date or an approximate time. So that says you're gonna be in Wyoming and there's a bunch of hunters that want Wyoming, they're gonna see that and they're gonna be waiting for you. So you can kind of have a built-in pilot. You can also be in an area where you have no cell service. And that's, in my experience, been really, really common. So in that case, I will park somewhere and I will call CQ until somebody answers me. They may be a park hunter. They may not be. They may just be somebody that heard the CQ call and answered. So sometimes they know what I'm doing and they will go ahead and spot me. Sometimes they don't know what I'm doing. And then I explain what I'm doing and now they're interested and they pull up the web page while we're talking and they'll figure out how to spot me. Sometimes they can't figure out how to do the POTA spot, but they'll put me up on the DX. So that helps too. It's also fair to go on to a repeater and ask somebody to spot you. That contact doesn't count, but you can recruit spotters that way. So there are a lot of ways if you do not have a cell signal that you can get around that and try and get people to contact you. Um, for CW, you can actually, there's a reverse beacon network. So if you already have a spot that's scheduled on the website, if you do your call sign twice in a row, that beacon will pick you up and it will spot you. So that's also a really neat benefit for those who do CW. There's also the possibility that if you have your husband with you, you send him <laughs> down the road with an HT and tell him to spot me. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm familiar with that. <laughs> it has. It has. Um, so I do paper logging when I am doing the activation. I'm just, like I said, I'm not a techno person. And paper just has a much less chance of failing on me. I'm not gonna have Windows try and do an update in the middle of my activation. 
I'm not going to have a battery fail. I'm not going to have it just lose my activation on the way home. I know I've lost all my contacts. So I like paper logging because it's just a lot more flexible and it, it does do a little bit of extra work because when I get home, now I've got this paper log that I now have to put into a computer before I can send it in. But I also like just having that permanent record. I keep these paper logs forever. So that's just kind of an example of one of my recent ones. And the, there's a bunch of different logging programs that you can use for it. HamRS is one of the newer ones, and I have actually been using that, and I've been pretty happy with it. But there are some people that have had some glitches and some problems with it. So, you know, no problem is, no program is perfect. Um, why would you enjoy portable activation? Um, you get a way lower noise floor. For those of us that live in an urban environment, that is huge. I, when I first got my license and started trying to do HF, I had no idea how anybody heard anybody because our noise level at the house is on average a six to a seven. So I had no idea how any of this H stuff works. Like, how do people make contacts? I can't hear anything. And then we went on a camping trip and I went, oh, <laughs> wow. So that's how this is supposed to work. So for those of us in an urban environment, this is an opportunity to have a quiet location to work. Um, you get to watch wildlife while you're working the radio. Different terrain, you have, you know, space constraints. I had an activation in Montana. It was, I think it was my third activation and my first activation with an NFED. And I didn't understand the directionality yet. This is part of the learning. And we were in a valley. And I had the NVAD oriented to where it was just pointing both ends at the mountains. And I couldn't get anybody to hear me. And finally figured that out, reoriented it, boom. Every single one of my contacts was east because the mountains blocked me every other direction. And so that's part of understanding that propagation and understanding how your antenna works. And it's a fun way to learn that sort of thing. For me, that's a lot funner to, way to learn than reading it in a book. I'll read it in a book after something failed, and now I'm going to learn a lot better from it than if I read in it about, about it before and I'd never tried it before. Um, so it also, I think, makes you a better operator. Keeps your skills sharp. Running a really big pileup takes a lot of different radio skills, and I think it's really a great thing for anybody. And you'll make friends all over the world. So there are awards for activators. There's all kinds of different ways that you can chase awards. You can go for number of parks that you've activated. You can go for number of contacts in a specific park. There's an award for making a thousand contacts in one park. I'm going for that for Pike National Forest because we camp there. Every single weekend, we do a three-day three camping trip. That's three activations. I'm going to get the Kilo Award <laughs> for Pike National Park probably this summer. But, yeah, there's all kinds of different awards that you can get. And for hunters, there are also awards on their side. The neat thing about it for hunters is they do not need to log. So the activators are the only ones that do the logging. The activator submits their log that gives the hunters credit. So it's really, really important that even if you didn't get that 10 QSOs and your activation didn't count, put your log in anyway, because otherwise those hunters didn't get credit. It's the only way they get credit. But it's also a nice incentive for those hunters to make sure that you got their call sign because you're their only hope of getting credit for that part. So that is an example of the spotting page. They've updated the layout a little bit since the slide was made, but this is a pretty good example of, of how the basic layout is. And so it'll show you, you know, the park number, the call sign. If you hover over the call sign, it'll actually give you more information about the name of that operator and where they live, how many activations they've done. And then it'll also down at the bottom tell you like when it was last respotted because not everybody has a cell phone signal where they're activating. 
So they might not be able to go in here and mark this spot as QRT. So if you see one that hasn't been heard from for 25 minutes, they're probably QRT. So there are, like I said, there are also hunter awards. And then this is kind of a nice little slide that compares soda versus poda. So soda, obviously about summits, hiking oriented, no commercial power, no fossil fuel generators, can't be attached to a vehicle, and you, but you only need four QSOs to get an activator point. Poda is parks, hiking, vehicle, camping, you can do any of those. Any power source is okay. Vehicle operation is okay. But you need 10 QSOs for a successful <laughs> activation. So getting started, each website, you do need to, whether you're an activator or a hunter, you need to go in and get registered on the website, which is free and easy. And a lot of people recommend that you start by either chasing or hunting because it helps you learn the program and how it works before you become an activator. So you can you learn how to use the spotting websites, how to use the apps, how to find the activators, and kind of how the general thing works. Your first activation, I do recommend you go not very far from home because it's easier to research a place if it's really close. You're probably already familiar with the park versus driving three hours to a place you've never been to before. And, you know, there's just so many things that can go wrong with that. And there's so much more research that has to be done to make that successful. So don't make it harder than it needs to be. Start out at a local park. Choose a band or mode that you're already comfortable with. And try to minimize how many things could possibly cause you problems because you don't want to make your first one miserable. You want to make it fun. That's the whole point. And you can also tag along with an experience activator. Some of us are more like in the moment of, hey, I've got a free day. I'm going to pack stuff up and go activate. Those are a little harder to tag along with because you might not get a whole lot of notice. But others are planned out. And a lot of times somebody is more than willing to take someone else along and kind of show them the ropes. And if they're going out and doing this by themselves, there's an advantage to them too. Now I've got somebody to help me set up my antenna. Maybe somebody that could log for me. That'd be cool too. <laughs> so here's a list of resources for both. And I will come back and leave this slide up if anybody wants to jot those down. And again, another plug for combining soda and poda. All right, that's the end of my slides. Are there any questions for poda? Go ahead, Lauren. Um, I was just curious, is uh, the logging for uh, chases for soda the same as the requirement for oh, that you don't have to log? For no. Activity? For soda, both have to log. The website requires the two to match. One of the things that makes being a chaser at home a neat thing is that these stations are portable, okay? The soda stations are, are as you see, are very uh, portable and low power. Even mm -hmm. with Tricia with her um, Wolf River coil and 100 watts, it's still a portable station. Mm -hmm. At home, you have a fixed station. And if you hear that person, you're more than likely gonna be able to mm -hmm. operate them. So chasing them from home, makes it a lot easier uh, than, uh, you know, hunting DX or, you know, trying to de dig DX out of a pile up or other things. Yeah. If you can hear them, you're, you're pretty much going to work them if you even have just a modest 100 watt station and a wire. Now, I am very fond of using all of the power necessary or all of the power that I have, but when I chase, I'll crank that thing down to 100 watts, and it, I'm amazed at how few calls I have to make to get through on 100 watts on the wire. Every once in a while, I, I'll put, punch the switch <laughs> on the end when the guy obviously doesn't have very good ears. But for the most part, a modest station at home, you can you can chase or hunt 
very, very, very well. Yep. And I mean, if you watch signal reports or listen to a pileup and somebody working it, you'll notice that nine times out of 10, most of the chasing stations are getting five nines because it's not a compromised antenna and it's not a low power station. So if you can hear me, I can definitely hear you. Yeah, and one of the things that I enjoyed about POTA, uh, thanks to Tricia and Mr. James there, um, it's a great way to knock off a bunch for your worked all states because you can go to the POTA website, you know exactly what frequency to tune to, and you listen, if you, like Trish was saying, if you can hear them, they can hear you. And even if they're weak, I mean, they'll pick up and they'll give you a signal report of a 3-3. Three, three. I even got a 2-2. Two, two. I got a 2-2 two, two signal report today from South Carolina. So, I mean, people, you know, they, they want to make a contact out there. And, uh, it's a great way to knock off a lot of states for your worked all states if you want to yep. chase that certificate. Yeah, and the same as an activator. As an activator, that's how I got Alaska. It was Alaska needed Colorado. And so they chased me. And we made it, made it work, and we were 3-3 three, three both ways. But the instant I heard Alaska, I went for him. <laughs> and everybody else got to wait until we got it worked out. Any other questions, comments? Was it, it was fun to have Japan in your pilot. It was. So we did an activation during a camping trip and I had called CQ, had a big pile up and was just working through it. And I was just very, very focused on trying to pull as many stations as I could out because I knew I had a lot of people calling and I really wanted to get them all. And I'm still a newbie, so I don't always recognize a different country's call sign. And I'm just focused on getting them written down and moving on to the next one. Japan chased me during an activation. And I had no idea until I got home and put it in the computer. And I thought I typed it wrong. And then I thought my handwriting was wrong. <laughs> and then I emailed him and, yep, it was real. There is Hoda in Japan, and he did actively chase me because he wanted the park. Yeah. <laughs> that was on 17. Yeah, it was on 17 meters. And that's the other neat thing about these programs is there's not, because it's not a contest, yeah. you don't have those band restrictions. Okay. You can be anywhere you want to be as long as you're not on a repeater. And when the non work bands are just slammed with a contest, mm -hmm. you go up to the work bands and you'll see POTUS stations and you'll be able to make contacts with the POTUS stations yep. where it's, you know, when some of these guys with their splatter and, and all that kind of stuff on a contest, it's impossible. Right. But, you know, with the solar numbers getting better and better and better, um, 17, 12, and 10 are coming alive. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of code activity. Yeah. And that's part of the incentive too on the activator side of it, of making sure that you've got an arsenal of antennas. Because I'm guilty of, I don't always look ahead of time. I pick a weekend that I'm free or a day that I'm free and the weather is not going to be horrible. And I go do an activation and I turn on the radio and that's when I find out there's contests going on. So if I didn't already bring an antenna, that can do a different band, I'm apparently working the contest because that's my only choice now. Go ahead, Jay. So do you have to identify your park and your peak? I know Bob's slide when he was calling CQ, mm -hmm. he was identifying the park. Yes. Uh, but you know, I'll listen and I see these guys in CQ Oda mm -hmm. call sign, that's it. Yep. And should I slow them down and ask for the park designation? There is it? never a wrong thing. I mean, if you need to, if you have not heard that park, you should ask because it should be being said fairly. Re it doesn't need to be said every single time, just like your call sign doesn't have to be every single time. But it really should be fairly frequent because it also saves you time. If you are saying it periodically, 
then you don't have to keep repeating it when you make a QSO. If they've already got it written down before they make the, the contact because even they've if, been sitting there waiting. Even if it's a spotted park on, on that spotted list, mm -hmm. there's only one park spotted. And if you ask that guy that park number, you're liable to find out that he's working in a, in a location that has three or four parks. Yep. And, and you'll get credit for all of those parks in the uh, awards for mm -hmm. being a hunter or a chaser. Anybody else? Do they have awards for, uh, can you get an award just for 10 years? 17 years mm -hmm. yeah. yeah there's tons i mean <laughs> pretty much pick like yeah. what you want to kind of yeah. focus on yeah. and there's probably an award for it so there's an award for like working multiple bands in one park there's an award on the chaser side of chasing yeah. multiple bands in the same park and so you'll have some activators that with during the activation they will on purpose switch bands yeah. because they're going for one of those and the chasers will spot it right away. It's like, oh yeah, I can hit that one again. They they give you awards for about everything. Yeah. I mean, there there's a there's an award for working six bands. There's a frequent offender award for working the same park 20 times. <laughs> there's a late shift award if you work after zero 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 Zulu time. Mm -hmm. which is now six o'clock our local time. So you get late shift, you get 50 late shifts, you get an award. I mean, <laughs> they got, you can wallpaper your ham shack. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And on the activator site, you also get awards for late shift. So if you do 10 late shift activations, you get an award for that. You get awards for park to park contacts, just like summit to summits. And so you know, you'll hear an activator and you you think you hear a park to park in that pileup, you pull them out right away because there's extra points for those. Anybody else? All right, awesome. Thank you. Thanks.